Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a great lunch. And now that your bellies are full, you must be slowly falling into sleep. But not here at Joy of Coding, because we now have the most exciting program for you, which will guarantee keep you awake, because it's time for our lightning talks. A lightning talk takes exactly five minutes, and during that time you will have a wonderful introduction into some principle or technology or anything really. And I'll, when those five minutes are up, we'll give them, the speaker, a great applause, whether they are finished or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a great lineup for you, eight speakers and all. So we have only 15 minutes, so I will be very brief in my introductions. And the first speaker uh, is a organizational anarchist an avid cyclist, but also a code review specialist. So give us a hand for Elisabeth Zagroba. Hello. I disagree with the earlier introduction. Feel free to take a nap. Uh, let's see. OK. Ah, brilliant, my slides. Um, I'm here to tell you about how to strengthen your code review skills. My main message will be to say less than you were going to. Let's see what we're going to talk about. OK, so I've got this feedback funnel. This is all of the feedback that you could possibly give in a code review. And as I go through the talk, we'll whittle this down to fewer and fewer things in the funnel until you have just like the little bit of stuff you should actually say in a code review instead of all the stuff you were going to say. OK, so let's say you get a request. Um, you're working in feature branches. You get a merge request. Someone asks you to review it. The first thing you should think about is, who are they to me? Who is this person? What relationship do I have with them? Um, are they going to be able to listen to the feedback that I have? Are they on some other team? What's their roadmap like? What are their what, uh, constraints on their time and abilities, right? Um, if they are um, in a place where they're really stressed out and don't have time to listen to the feedback that you would give them, just don't give them any. You don't have to. Great. So now we're like out of the blue zone. We're into the, the more teal part, right? We have less, less and less feedback we're going to give them. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is focus on what matters. Start by praising what they did well. That will keep them so they keep doing that good stuff, and that stuff stays in the code base. When you're reviewing the code, ask, what does the code do? A lot of the other stuff that the code doesn't do or just doesn't matter, you can decide to let go of. Um, as a tester, I'm often re looking at the code, reviewing it for readability, looking for reusability, what pieces do we want to take out of this like one particular test and move into a more central place, or um, what are some weird scenarios that could happen? What error cases should we handle here? What are we missing? I ask for some what ifs. But if you're getting a merge request like this and you're asking, oh, why is line 62 and line 65 only one line of white space and then the other two are two lines? Just no, that is not the kind of detail that you want in a merge review. Let the linter catch that, have some coding guidelines, have something to point to so that you're not offering that feedback over and over again, right? If it's something that's just named not exactly the way you would name it, it's fine, it still works, it still does the thing it's supposed to, let it go. Okay, then once you decide, we're like down to just the lighter green feedback now. So we have to communicate what we want to communicate well. We have to decide what level of abstraction we're going to offer it at and in what format. So you probably, like GitLab def and GitHub for that matter, default to offering inline comment suggestions, right? Of like, you missed this, you missed this, you missed this. And you don't want to communicate that if they missed it 20 times. Take a step back communicate it on the entire merge request, or even better, move the conversation to Slack, move it to a Zoom call, decide how this person will receive the feedback, what is the best way to send it to them, and then you have the opportunity to say, let's discuss it, let's discuss it offline, do something different. The default in the tool doesn't have to be your default. Yeah, that's all I got there. Okay, so now we're down into yellow. Feedback you're actually gonna get, right? We got less, even, even less, okay. So now we're going to shorten the delivery gap. 
That means the time between when the person wrote the code and the time that they are receiving this feedback that you have about their code. Make that smaller. So if you can make that, like probably if you're doing feature branching and merge requests, you're doing that really asynchronously, the closer you can get to doing it at the same time, right? Why have I had all these slides separately where I'm showing the examples? Just put it all together, do it all at the same time, uh, pair together, and then instead of having a situation where you're waiting for hours or days to get the feedback, you have to switch context, you don't know what's happening anymore, you can stay in the same context and work together. It doesn't have to be a competition where you're criticizing each other, you can collaborate and foster a good relationship at work. Doesn't that sound nice? Just do that. Yes. Here are other things about feedback and code reviews. Look at them later. That's all. <laughs> Thanks. Amazing. Well, that was absolutely amazing. Such, so many informa much information in one short five minutes, not even five minutes. So I just might have to change my code review style. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, next up, uh, being both a software engineer and a musician is a particularly effective way of getting on stage this year. Our next piece, speaker discovered this too. Please let your hands come together for Antonello. Hi everyone, so come together, the joys of the community. Let's talk a bit about uh, one of the most important tools that we have in, uh, in every industry, actually, the community. We are being part of a community right here, right now. Um, I'm Antonello, I'm a software engineer at Molly in Amsterdam, uh, but I'm also a musician. Uh, are there any musicians in the room today? I guess so, right? Quite, quite a bit, yeah, expected more, actually, but yeah. Um, yeah, again, I'm also a musician. Back in Italy, I started a band, I started writing songs, I started, um, I, we produced a record, we produced a, a music video, a theater show even, so we toured uh, in the central Italy for, uh, uh, for quite a while, for three years, so I've been an active part of the musician's community. Uh, but I've been also part of the uh, coders of the uh, developers community. Uh, I've been part of my PHP user group in Rome. Uh, I spoke to a couple of conferences in Verona. Then three years ago, I moved uh, to the Netherlands. I started attending the O10 PHP local meetup. Uh, so I tried to be also uh, an active part of the developers community uh, in both uh, the countries. Uh, and I started building in my mind a comparison between these two communities, what we can learn from each other, right? Um, especially on their artifacts or on their events, on their practices. For example, uh, I started making a comparison between gem sessions and pair programming. They're kind of the same thing. There's brains working together towards a single uh, objective in a way, but pair programming is more structured, there's, there's more guidelines. Gem sessions are more free flow, more creativity, improvisation, which is incredibly beautiful. Um, but they're both healthy. Uh, practices, right? So uh, as much as open mics and meetups, uh, both are very good for networking, uh, are very good for learning new things and new music, uh, for experimenting new things if you're a speaker or a songwriter, for example. Uh, again, both very, very healthy practices. Uh, that's where the problem starts, because um, our daily job as a software engineers compared to live concert is it's, 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 it's different. Um, as, as software engineers, we are very well paid. Uh, it's relatively easy to find a new job when we lose one or we decide to change jobs compared to other industries, right? Uh, it's not the same for, for a musician that plays um, their songs uh, live. It's, uh, it's hard to make, uh, to get consistently uh, new gigs and to be paid fairly, it's, uh, it's still hard. So this leads to competition and we don't want that. Uh, it's, it's not healthy. Um, festival and conferences, yeah, they're both good, again, good, good for networking, uh, good for learning new things, good for uh, experimenting also new things, but what I experienced in, in, uh, in festival, especially if you're not an established musician, if you're not a famous musician, is competition again, because 
uh, I want to be, I want to play in that time slot where a lot of people are, and I don't want to play at the 2 p.m. time slot in which uh, nobody's listening to me. Or, or I want a bigger name in the uh, in the festival poster, so that kind of competition again, unhealthy. So what did I learn in the end? Uh, that it's in both cases a team sport. So you can write songs solo, you can write code alone, but uh, in the end, um, the, piece, the beautiful pieces of code and, and music are uh, written together, are, are created together. So collaboration. Uh, what we can in, uh, import from the musicians' community is maybe the free flow, the creativity, the improvisation, room for improvisation, right? Uh, what we shouldn't learn, uh, we shouldn't import is uh, competition. We don't need competition between engineers, between uh, conferences, between uh, tools. We don't need competition. We are stronger together. Uh, again, it's a team sport. Thank you. Well, those are definitely interesting similarities. Thank you, Antonello. Next up, a Frisian abroad, a model-driven geek, and a code sculptor who loves language engineering, which is actually what this talk is about. Give some hands for Meinte Boersma. So, the joy of language engineering. Um, then, what is language engineering? Um, Here's a definition for a language, which we have to start with. Uh, a software la language uh, is something I see as a set of tools to support some kind of digital activity. Uh, tools you can think of an ID, or an editor, or a compiler, or an interpreter, or a linter, or what, what have you not. So here's a bunch of languages that you, software languages that you might know. I'll drop the software from now on because it's sort of implied in this context. So first of all, we have all the nice programming languages that we know of. Um, we also have modeling languages like UML that some of us might still know. Um, my main interest is in domain-specific languages, or DSLs. Um, so we have, a, we have a lot of technical DSLs like HTML, CSS, SQL, etc. I'm not so interested in those. I usually try to deal with as much as possible with business-oriented DSLs, so DSLs for business users, non-programmers. OK, you might have heard of location, location, location. We have the same thing in language engineering. Notation, notation, notation. Notation of a language is, is the primary aspect or a key aspect of, of, of a language and also of DSLs. Um, it's, 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 after all, the main user interface, so to speak, of, of a language. So you might recognize a couple of, of these languages here. Um, don't think I'll give bonus points for if you can name them all. Um, by the way, we language engineers also refer to notation as the concrete syntax of a language. So, most of those languages that we see... Oh, I want to go back. Most of the languages that we see here and also here are textual. That is, the, the, stuff, they, um, uh, the stuff you write is purely text in, an er in a text editor or something like that. Uh, so, how would you go about making such a textual language? Well. Um, you need a parser. Um, you need a parser uh, that turns your text um, from text into structured data. And that structured data we call an abstract syntax tree. That's also why we have a concrete syntax, because you have concrete syntax and then also abstract syntax. So this abstract syntax tree, or AST, um, is, a, is a, well, a sort of a tree. It, it, has, it has nodes, it has uh, data on the nodes, and it has relations uh, between those nodes. So your text gets turned into that uh, as soon as you parse it. Um, as soon as you have an AST, you can do interesting things with it, like compile it, run it in an interpreter, check some constraints, uh, do syntax highlighting, and do things like content assist. Uh, a lot of these things you have to feed back into your text editor um, to provide the user with enough uh, feedback. And that's not always so joyful. This is a bit complicated. It's well understood, but it's still tedious. So it's a little bit like there's a, the upside down thing going on you know, where you have your pros in nice concrete syntax and you have a abstract syntax tree that lives sort of in, in down under uh, together with, I think, as Will. So is there a better way or a nicer way? I think there is, and it's called projectional languages. 
So this is how you make a projection language, and you do that by turning the AST into pro, into the pro. So not a text, but you have a, you start with an AST, then you have a projector, um, which projects your AST into a nice projection, and then this is typically rendered uh, as a as a DOM uh, by a browser. Um, so this 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 works very well. It has a it has a lot of advantages. Um, um, yeah, let's go. I'm missing some slides. So, um, yeah. So, why is this nicer, or at least why do I think it's nicer? Um, your notation can be anything. It can be text if you prefer that way, but it can you can also make it completely graphical or something uh, in between. Uh, the key thing is you have to make this projectional projection editable. Uh, so you expand the projection. Um, so you expand the projector or the projection with um, uh, actions that the browser uh, can trigger. Uh, and then you uh, feed uh, those actions back uh, to the AST to change it, and then you run the uh, projector again, and, um, uh, and then uh, this whole cycle starts anew. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm missing a slide or two, it turns out. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, then uh, come to me afterwards. Uh, I'm also writing a book about this stuff, uh, so I have uh, QR codes, and etc. for that, and if you have a really good question, the first three Good questions. We'll get a code for a free copy of the book. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Meinte. My guess is there will be much more upcoming about abstract, abstract syntax trees. Our next speaker is a shape shifting test engineer. I do wonder what he will change into. A unicorn or a griffin? Let's find out with Arjan Block. Hey everybody, I'm here to talk about the Test Automation University. Um, now I must warn you, it's uh, not a very educational talk, but if there's, uh, it's more a story about my joy of coding. But if there's one thing you can take away from this is that you sh if you even r are remotely interested in testing and test automation, you should definitely go check them out. It's a website where you can do uh, uh, free trainings. Um, and with the answering or doing these courses, you can earn points. And with these points, you get a ranking. So you go, you start basically as a as a unicorn, and you can go uh, all the way up to a griffin if you complete all the courses and uh, and earn a lot of points. Um, the reason I'm on stage here, or I submitted this lightning talk, was uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, Joy of Coding. That was in 2019, unfortunately. Uh, I met Angie Jones. She is uh, uh, very well known in the testing community and also a great speaker. She was on stage here giving a talk, and I thought it would be cool to be on the same stage talking about, because she's actually also one of the people behind the Test Automation University. So I thought it would be cool to be on stage uh, talking about a product uh, she launched, basically, uh, sort of an homage. So when, uh, when the Test Automation University was initially launched, you could do a lot of online courses. Um, and it became sort of a hobby of mine of doing all of them, and then when a new one came out, I would also do it. Um, they would also have a profile page um, where you could see your profile, your points, uh, your, the current rank you have, uh, uh, also the certificates that you, you got for every, every course. Um, but then, then they uh, released a new feature, which was a leaderboard. And lo and behold, I was at the number one spot. Well, shared actually, but my name uh, beats the other guy alphabetically, so I won. Um, <laughs> So, you know, getting to the first spot is what they say is easy, or getting to the top, but staying there is difficult. So the race to be on top, because I, I made a few mistakes answering questions, you know, I didn't know everything. Um, so staying on top was the, the goal here. Um, you know, it's on like Donkey Kong. So with everything, all the courses that I took, I learned a lot about API testing and about uh, JavaScript, TypeScript. So I was able to hack uh, together a script that basically scraped the website for all the course information and brute forced all the answers, <laughs> <coughs> stored that information. Then all I needed to do was write another script that submitted that information. Um, yeah, I was golden. I had some challenges. No time for those now. <laughs> 
but um, I managed to get the first pot with a, uh, with a perfect score, so I was pretty happy about that. And I, I, I tweeted, I, uh, so I made a tweet about that. And um, uh, unfortunately, well, I made it very obvious I cheated because, you know, Rick Ashley was there. Um, <coughs> my account got suspended. Oh. So I talked to Angie Jones, and she told me that they, were, they thought I hacked the database because I had all that information. I explained her what, how it worked or what I did. And uh, I promised to never do it again, of course, because cheating is bad, even if the website that you do it on teaches you everything you need to know to do it. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, and another... Oh, I think I missed one slide. Well, anyway... Um, these lists, don't take them too serious, because, you know, if I can do it, uh, well, the current guy that's at number one uh, also has a perfect score, so we all know uh, what's, on, what's going on there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think Arjan turned out to be a hacker, <laughs> and well done from him. <laughs> Um, our next speaker is a software consultant by day and a tinkerer by night. Let's see if he can have a macro impact with his presentation on the micro bit. Give a hand to Ties van de Ven. Uh, hey everybody, welcome to my talk about having macro impact with a micro bit. Uh, first, to get a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ties van de Ven and I work for a company called J Driven. And a big pillar of J-Driven is sharing knowledge. That's why I'm, for example, on this conference. So we go to conferences, we give trainings, we do coaching. We think it's very important to increase the level of engineering everywhere. And because we like sharing knowledge so much, at some point we came in contact with a foundation called the Yink Foundation. And they asked us, hey, we're trying to put uh, children who don't have that much of opportunities in opportunity-rich environments can you help us with that? Because IT is a very opportunity-rich environment. And we were instantly like, sure, let's do that. And then it dawned upon us that, oh shit, we need to entertain some kids for like four hours. Uh, how the hell do we do that? And hopefully teach them a bit about programming as well. So when you look on the internet for that, um, one of the first things you come across, uh, across is the Scratch programming language, which is an amazing visual language where you have building blocks, and you can use those building blocks to create code to animate that little figure over there. And these building blocks are very good for kids to learn how to write software, because those building blocks will only fit into other blocks if the notches and such are correct. So you have a lot of visual clues uh, for kids to learn what goes where, because otherwise it just won't fit. And as you can see, they can be very easy instructions like, when you, the flag has been clicked forever, move 10 steps and turn around. But this, uh, I had some experience with showing me this kiss and it's not really good to keep them engaged for a longer time. For that, it really helps to add some hardware to it. Lego Mindstorms is something I've worked with with kids as well, uh, which is really cool. Uh, you have Lego robots and you can use a scratch-like la scratch -like language to program them. And there's whole lots of chaos going on with robots fighting each other and such. A lot of fun. The problem, however, is uh, when the kids like it, then the parents come to us and ask, so, uh, what, how much does it cost? What can I do to get this for my kid? <laughs> and when they hear the price tag, then it suddenly doesn't become an option anymore. So we kept on looking, and we ended up with the micro bit. And micro bit is from the BB originally made by the BBC and now by the Microbit Educational Foundation. And its goal is to inspire every child to have the best digital future. And just like Lego Mindstorms, it combines Scratch with hardware. But the nice thing about this, it's priced at 15 euros. So it's a very affordable thing. So what do you get for 15 euros? Um, you get an LED display with uh, 25 LEDs uh, of LEDs, so you can put text on it, you can put numbers on it. You have two programmable buttons. You have some uh, ports where you can add more hardware to it. It has a whole bunch of sensors, like there's Bluetooth, it has a light sensor, it has a compass, it has an accelerometer. So a lot of sensors you can play with. And the code kind of looks like this. Um, 
uh, wrote a bit of software that on start we turn off the LEDs. Uh, I don't know if it's readable actually, but it says on shake, uh, send the number one over Bluetooth and turn off the LEDs. And when the software receives a number, then turn on the LEDs. And then you get into thing, uh, get a thing where, you, for example, you have two of these and they now, over Bluetooth, you can throw a ball. That's all it takes to, for two pieces of hardware to communicate over Bluetooth. Uh, <laughs> when I saw this, that's when I knew that the microbit was something very powerful indeed. And you can do other cool projects with it. I only picked two because we have five minutes. Uh, this used to be a GIF, a GIF for a moving image uh, where somebody mounted a microbit to a steering wheel so it could use it to actually steer it in, uh, steer a motorcycle in a game. Some guy automated his entire plant uh, to water his plants, where uh, a microbit would uh, uh, control that servo engine to dr drip and water in the plants now and then. And he even had one microbit in the center which connected to Bluetooth to all those things to give them instructions and such. So it's actually a really powerful, cool thing. And for education purposes, it's even more brilliant because there's a very active community in this. And because it's for education and for kids, Basically, all the material is for free. So if you want to get started, those things are only 15 euros. If you don't know what to do, just go on the internet and you get tons of course material for free. Um, if you want the link for that, just go to microbit.org. Um, if you want to have these slides or have any questions whatsoever, feel free to add me on Twitter and we'd love to help you out. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> and enjoy the conference. Yeah. That was impeccable timing. Exactly five minutes. I'm impressed. And also, the micro bit is yet another gadget I must own. No, not more. Uh, anyway, uh, he's a coder, a runner, and a tense gritty worshipper. He will take us from the virtual to the real. Please welcome Gerald de Jong. Thank you. How do we go to the next slide like this? Yeah. Okay. So um, I uh, have been a coder since I was a teenager. And uh, for about 20 years, I was freelancer in the Netherlands, which gave me some time occasionally between gigs to explore some fun stuff. So I went back to something that I had picked up a long time ago from this guy. Back at university, I, was, I happened upon a book by Buckminster Fuller, and I was completely fascinated by all the stuff that he was talking about. So it took, me, uh, it took me a while to get my head around it, and yeah, life went on, so I just didn't uh, pursue it all that much further. Later on, another person appeared related to Buckminster Fuller, and that's Kenneth Snelson. He's an artist, and he makes this kind of art. Uh, probably a lot of you have seen something like that in Holland, because there is uh, at least one of those in Holland. So Ken was like my hero, I'm not worthy, because I was always fascinated by this kind of structure. This, these structures are special because they only consist of pushing and pulling elements. There's no twisting and there's no shear and nothing else. It's all just pushes and pulls. And the pushing things, the bars, are not touching each other. So it has a very interesting structure. Always been fascinating to me, and since I was a coder, I made a software model early on, and I started playing around with it, and I found out that you can explore a lot more when you don't have to worry about reality, when you can instead just deal with the software model. And basically, that's the biggest difference between Kenneth Nelson and me. I went to visit him in Manhattan, on Manhattan one time, uh, sort of kind of a, uh, 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 like I had to go see this guy because he created these amazing things. And so the difference between him and me is that I grew up coding. So I know the joy of coding from my teenage years and he was from a previous generation, so he never did anything with coding. So recently I decided to stop with my freelance activities and uh, 
build a site and explore what I could in, uh, in terms of this technology, but then also to build it physically, because I had been spending years building it virtually. And when everybody, anybody asked me, so like, what's your hobby? And I could just show them a screen. And I thought, maybe someday I can actually build it for real. So I ended up recently building these things for real. If you point your phone at this QR code, you can see the software that I built to design these things. And uh, this is a battle that I've been having since, hate to say it, from the 90s even. I was playing around with this kind of structure, but I could never put it online. And then came Java and the applet. So I could put applets online. So I built stuff, but it, you know, a couple of years later, it all disappeared. Fortunately, in the past few years, the technology to do this has reappeared. Uh, I do it with 3JS, and I do it with uh, Rust, and the uh, physics engine is written uh, in WebAssembly, which is amazing technology. It's what applets kind of were meant to be, in my opinion, because you can create a super fast functional module and uh, treat it like a piece of JavaScript. So when you're running this program, you will see the WebAssembly running in your phone. So yeah, the idea here was, how, what can I build with this stuff? And, and what the original artist, Ken Snelson, was able to build was tabletop models, and then he would sell the idea, and then he would build a big one. I start with a computer model, so I was thinking, can I actually ever build these things? And it took me a while to figure out the techniques, but eventually I could build it. And as a result, I could explore a vast design space that basically nobody has ever had access to before. So I, was, uh, I couldn't stop, and I still can't stop. So uh, here's an example of something that sort of looks like a person. Uh, yeah, so this is what I do. And uh, I'm going to continue exploring and seeing uh, what we can do further. The next project will be a, a three meter tall uh, example of this with glass bars with LEDs in them. So it's getting a little more exciting as time goes on. And uh, I have a little online store where I sell Sort of like the idea is to get this into people's hands, to get people conscious of how this works and to get it, get a feel for it in your hands. So if you go to that store, you can order with a discount code, Joy of Coding, 20% off. And uh, I've got a few with me, so if you order now, I can give it to you before you leave. That's all. Thank you. All right, wonderful graffiti-defying con contraptions. He is a teacher of things, all things front-end, freelance front-end developer, but apparently also the author of our most joyful fantasy processor emulator. Please give a hand to Martin Hus. So six months ago, I needed a little bit uh, joy of coding. I was between uh, projects. And of course, like so many of you, I decided to create a fantasy CPU emulator. Um, why I did I do this? Um, when I started to learn how to program, it was in Java, PHP, JavaScript, all high-level languages, and was far, far removed from the CPU. And after three years, I was thinking, I'm programming all these uh, things, websites, uh, forums, you name it, but I don't have any clue what the CPU is actually doing uh, with my programs. So I came across this video on YouTube by a guy called Richard Buckland, and uh, what he did was he showed uh, a, a very simple model on how you can learn uh, to, uh, to understand what a CPU does. So uh, this is an interactive demo, uh, and I'm going to explain to you what this program uh, does. Uh, so first, uh, the CPU communicates with, um, with the memory, with the RAM memory. So that, those are the, the cells you see below, starting with 9, 14, and, and 10. 
And each cell in memory has an address, and that address is just, yeah, it's just in the memory. Uh, and uh, they start at zero, and they continue all the way up to 15, because in this fantasy emulator, we don't have that many bytes. The upper part uh, are the registries, and uh, a CPU has registers. And a modern CPU has a lot of registers, but this one is, uh, is very uh, pitiful. It only has two working registers and two bookkeeping registers. So the first registry is the IP registry, and it contains uh, where the program is currently running at. So you can see it as a sort of keeps track of the line. And the IS uh, register keeps track of what instruction is currently executed. A CPU, and to my amazement, only works with numbers. So that was one thing I learned. And everything is a number for CPU. Uh, uh, an instruction is a number. What, what do I have to do? And of course, calculating with numbers, those are also numbers. So code is data, and data is code. So the CPU has a limited set of instructions. Each CPU manufacturer defines their own uh, instructions. For example, the first instruction is 0, means stop the program, I'm finished. And for example, the most fun instruction is 7, that makes a beeping noise. It's not the code clavier, but it's, uh, it's fun. From uh, 7 to below, those are two-byte instructions. Those are instructions that don't operate on a single memory cell, but on two memory cells. So now that you understand the basics, let's see what this program does. So the first thing uh, you have to understand is when you program in such a manner is that you put your variables away from your code. So that's what you see below. You see 5 and 37, so very far away removed from the code. We're going to load in those two numbers and count them up together. So first step, what happens is that uh, the instruction pointer is loaded with 9, because that's on the first cell because of the IP. And then it will look to the next cell, which is 14, and will use that as a reference to see what you want to load in memory. In this case, the 5. That's why it's orange. So the next step will land us on cell number 2, because uh, uh, 9 is a 2-byte instruction, so it skips 2. 9 of 10 loads up uh, into R1, so we will take cell number 15, load it up, put it in the registry, and then it will uh, continue to the fourth uh, memory cell. This is a one-byte instruction, one, and what it does is it increments R1 plus R0. What's, the, what's funny about this is that a CPU can only operate on registers, not in memory. So it has to do every calculation inside of a register. So if we skip this step, you'll see that the answer is 42. But that 42 is now locked into a register. We need to see it, because otherwise we can't know what we calculated. So what uh, 11 does is it's going to write to a certain place in memory. And in this case, it's going to write at position number uh, 8, which points to that 0, which is now yellow. So it's going to write it down there. It's going to say 42. The next instruction is print. This is a special two-byte instruction. It actually looks at the next cell and literally prints that one. So and now you can see in the printer below, it, it printed 42. Um, and also, it hits a zero, and it will stop. The funny thing about this way of looking at CPU is that you can see that code is data and data is code. So the, the 8 on, on cell number 6 means something different than the 8 on cell number 7. So it has a, a different meaning. Um, so this is a very, very small program, uh, which counts up two numbers, not too, uh, not too fancy. But I have a very, very, very big program here. <laughs> and what it does is it fills a hole in my instruction set. I don't have multiples. I can't multiply. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this up to speed number one, just run it. It will, uh, oh, no, I don't mean speed number one. I mean even faster. Play it. Yes. <laughs> And what it did is it calculated the 5 times 4. So this code you see here, it took me about two days to write. <laughs> I'm not used to writing code like this, so I really had to get a pen and paper, and then I had to uh, do that. So if you want to see more, just go to my blog post. You can see all the examples. And, you and I also have a part two in which you can see how it's made with React and JavaScript. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Ah, the joys of self-modifying code. It makes me feel nostalgic. nostalgic. Back in the days when you had a Commodore 64, I don't know how many of you had a Commodore 64? Good, you can write these lovely programs in assembler and then just code a for loop by incrementing the actual comparison value so that you, you didn't have to use a separate memory location to st store the counter. The only disadvantage was that if you stopped the program halfway, then all your counters were uh, initialized with the wrong value. So really, self-modifying code, not such a good idea. But I see that our ne <laughs> next speaker is ready, and that is great, because he has a passion for gamification and motivation theory. Not surprisingly, this is exactly what this talk is about. <laughs> Thank May you. I have a hand for Alexander? Oh, too complicated. I was the only one that his last name wasn't called, okay. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, let's just immediately get started. Uh, my name is Alexander Gatsagarias, that is me, and that is my avatar, splitting image. Um, I work at JDriven, this talk uh, said everything about it, and I'm going to talk about five gamification examples that could make your projects more fun. I am noticing that uh, the laptop doesn't necessarily like the big screen, so frame rates might be a little bit lower than expected. Uh, but, you know, when you challenge Murphy's Law by making a game for a presentation, you know. <laughs> okay, so I'm go we're going to talk about things to make your projects more fun. And number one is fast feedback uh, loops. Uh, if you work in agile environments, you might have heard this one before. It's all about uh, bringing uh, feedback back as, pos as fast as possible so that you can react to it. Well, games do that a lot of times. Uh, oh, yeah, nice. Uh, for example, in the ways of leaderboards, as has been uh, told before, um, and leaderboards is a very good way to quickly show feedback to players that, you know, they are doing better, that they are growing. And uh, in your projects, you could do something similar, for example, uh, uh, most lines of code written leaderboard. Uh, or maybe uh, something better than that. Uh, most lines of code refact a little bit, and then you can be number one, and it gives a good feeling, and that, may, that is what makes fun. And then we have peer motivation, or uh, um, as you might have known, peer pressure, but this is not about pressuring to, uh, for doing things, uh, people doing things that they don't want. It's about you know, creating an environment of inclusion where people feel a part of a team and you know, follow the uh, best practices within the team. So I'm trying to find an imposter, uh, everybody's telling me number four. Number four is saying it's not uh, that it's not them. Well, I'll just take a guess, and thankfully, that is the imposter. And that's all about you know, uh, if your whole team is uh, write, is uh, writing code, test-driven uh, development, then there is very slim chances that there's uh, there's somebody in your team that is not going to be test uh, doing test-driven development. Well, uh, then competition. I just heard. Competition, uh, you shouldn't do that. I'm telling you, you should do competition. So that's a nice contradiction. Um, but uh, it's about uh, friendly competition. You know, you know it in sports, football, esports, um, and uh, you know it in cybersecurity with red versus blue teams. You probably heard about that one, that one before. Uh, and I mean, you could do something similar with your projects where, there we go, uh, where you have one team trying to break the project of another team. Uh, see who can break a project better than the other. Uh, there we go. As you can see, I'm a little bit of a pro gamer. <laughs> uh, then we have progression, very important. Uh, people hate having the feeling that they are stagnating, that they're not going f uh, forward. And progression, and games know this, and they show progression very visually, with progress bar, levels, you name it. Progression is very important. Uh, badges, uh, for example, you saw, you saw an example, just a couple of uh, talks uh, before mine. Um, and it's something you could actually do in your projects as well. Make it very visual what somebody needs to do to become a tech lead and make a progress bar towards tech lead or something like that. And, you know, give people the sense that they are getting closer to becoming a tech lead. And once they are a uh, tech lead of a project, maybe the, so the architect of the project, and, you know, the, then they have that good, fo the good dopamine hit that they're, you know, growing. Uh, and eventually, you know, they're going to become, uh, well, in games, uh, you're going to uh, call them gods amongst men. But 
in uh, maybe what we call it in software engineering is the single points of failure, uh, pretty much. Uh. <laughs> and then the last one, and personally, I think it's the most uh, important one or the trickiest one to implement, but very important one is uh, challenge flow. All right, so let's go surfing. So a uh, challenge flow in games is all about creating the perfect difficulty for your players. Things don't, uh, sh shouldn't be too hard or too easy. Uh, if things are too hard, you get frustrated. You're like, what the hell is this? Uh, how am I supposed to do this? D ever heard of deadlines, unreachable deadlines? It's exactly that. People get frustrated. Uh, if things are too easy, people get bored again. It's like, okay, this is easy. I'm not being challenged. I can do this with my eyes closed. Damn. <laughs> and then that is the moment where people, you know, start searching for other, uh, well, uh, projects. So what you want to do is create like the perfect difficulty where you, people get challenged, where it's fun, where they think that they are growing, where they're, you know, learning new things all the time. Uh, sometimes fail, sometimes need help, you know, things like that. And that's the perfect difficulty curve that's going to uh, keep people engaged and add a lot of fun to the project. Um, as you can see, time goes positive, so I have infinite time, so that's good. So thank you very much. This is my Twitter handle. Feel free to hit me up. That was absolutely amazing. Best visuals ever in a five-minute presentation. Thank you, Alexander. It was magnificent. Which also leads to the conclusion of this most exciting part of the program of Joy of Coding. Um, so I would like to thank all the Lightning Talk speakers for this magnificent uh, part of the program. And I would like to ask your patience for a brief moment for a technical intermezzo while we prepare for our next speaker. Thank you. <laughs>